Section 13 goes over basically the meat of what CentOS or Linux is in a network. It shows all the services like DHCP, providing addresses to other computers and devices to get on the internet, uh, web server setup, file sharing, and other such services. So yes, this first service that we're going to mess with, we need to be careful with. You should only have one DHCP server per network. So we'll have to do some modifications here to make sure that when we turn on DHCP, it will not mess up all of your home devices. So first off, if you go to settings on your CentOS 7 before it started, and go to network, it should be set to bridged. It should be what we finished 12 with. So we'll leave the setting at bridged and start our CentOS 7. And once it's started, we will need to use the control F2 and log into a text-based terminal. Do not log into the graphical interface. The graphical interface runs a check um, at first login for new packages. And when we try to run the yum command, sometimes they both try to run at the same time, and that's not allowed. So again, with our system started, I have not logged into sample user one in the graphics. I'll go control alt F2 and log in as root and pass one, two, three, four. And then I'll do the yum install DHCP. You will likely have some updates to install. Probably about four packages will be installed or updated. My system's already been updated, so it's just going to install the one. So I'll hit Y and enter. If you do have the auto updater checking, it'll start showing on the screen saying that package kit is currently running. It'll also give the process ID, allowing you to kill that process ID as we did in a previous lab, uh, previous chapter when we dealt with the kill commands. You can type in kill and the process ID that it gives you to stop the package kit. Or if you wait a while, the updates will finally check and package kit will close. And you can issue the yum command. Now, we need to change our adapter settings. So down here at the bottom, you'll see the two computer icons. You'll right click. You'll click on network settings. Here it brings up the same settings we've seen before, except now we're going to change it from bridged to internal, and then we'll click OK. So that is a critical step. You will also need to go to the VirtualBox Manager. Your Ubuntu should be powered off. Highlight it, click Settings, click Network, and change it from bridged to internal and then click OK. That allows the two virtual machines to talk with each other but they won't be able to talk with Windows or outside of your box to any of your other devices so they won't have DHCP packets being sent to your phone, tablets, or other computers on your network. Now back to the CentOS We'll log into the graphical interface by doing Control Alt F1. We'll log into Sample User 1. You can use Secret. And we'll do the easy route of changing our IP address. A DHCP server typically has a static address assigned to it because it is the one giving addresses out to all the other devices. So use your network settings icon. Click Network Settings, we'll click the cog wheel in the lower right, click on IP version 4, and we'll go from Automatic to Manual, and we'll set the following address. It should be pictured in the lab, use the same addresses. We don't really have a gateway, but just to show the function of 
DHCP, we're putting these addresses in. So once it looks like the picture on uh, step five, click apply. And I'm going to cycle my adapter on and off. And I should have them set. And if you do the cycle, you can skip the reboot of the CentOS 7 virtual machine. And then move on to step seven. Step seven, we open up a terminal window. And we switch over to the root account. And we edit the following file, Etsy. DHCP, DHCP D.conf. I'm going to navigate to the end of the file and insert the commands that are shown in step 7. Here I'm finishing up typing the text. Now many of your devices, like your router and stuff at home, will have a web interface that you type in through a graphical means of setting up DHCP. However, knowing this and knowing the files and stuff to edit, you could get into your router at the command line and add options that are not available at the graphical interface. So if you had some type of special setup that you wanted to do at home, you could edit most likely your your modem router, whatever that is dishing out addresses. And if you know DHCP and, and the options, you can do that. So I'm going to hit escape, type in a colon WQ to write and quit. Um, one extra little thing, don't forget all the semicolons. It has to be typed exactly as you see it in step seven. So I'm going to save and quit. And start the DHCP server. And I forgot the D, meaning that it's a daemon. It's a service that's going to service other clients on the network. Now I need to open up the firewall so the clients can ask for an IP address. that's successful. I'm going to go back and look at this line once more time. If we're looking at this, we're going to be giving out addresses to clients that ask the server starting at 50. And we can give out addresses all the way up to 100. We're also going to give them the network mask, DNS server to connect to, and the router how to get outside of the network. And how long can they keep that address once they get it? That's pretty standard on all DHCP servers. So our Ubuntu should get probably the 50 address since it'll be the first client that's going to connect. So with this running, let's go to our Ubuntu and power it on. When Ubuntu powers up, We'll log in as root. Enter the IF config. And you should see the ETH0 in the second line, INET address 172.16.0.50. This is where you'll take the screenshot and name it as project 13-1. If you don't get an address, Double check, make sure that you have the internal network set for both Ubuntu and CentOS 7. And you can also go to CentOS 7 and check. We can grep dhcp slash var slash log slash star and we will search 
everything that has DHCP and you can send me a screenshot of this if it didn't start up and work correctly and I might be able to see an error message in here stating that maybe you mistyped something in step 7 or you might be able to spot where it says error um, loading say option routers or something like that so that you can notice that you misspelled the word routers and it's not loading up so if you have those issues send me screenshots and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible now on our CentOS they want to show us or have us look at the lease information so on step 13, we're going to view the DHCP lease file. So here we have one client that is leased address 172.16.0.50 from us. Uh, they can start the lease on the 16th. And it looks like the lease ends on the 17th. So it's a one day lease. And then the client will have to communicate again. It normally communicates at the 12 hour mark and tries to release for another day. You'll learn more advanced DHCP in local area networking one, Cisco, LAN two, and some of your other classes. It's covered in about every one of our classes since it is such a important protocol. If it doesn't work, then all the clients on the local network will not be able to communicate with each other. So with that all working, let's shut down the DHCP system. Now we did not do a system control enable DHCPD. So it will not start on reboots. In this step, we've shut down. And now that it just shut down, we can safely, or you might want to just do one more step and do a status. And make sure that it is disabled and it's inactive dead just before that you turn it back to bridged mode. So we're going to go back to network settings and change the internal network back to bridged and hit OK. You just have to have DHCP shut down before you do that or it could start messing up your other devices. Now I'll do the same thing on my Ubuntu. Network settings, change it back to bridged, now I'll hit OK. Now in CentOS, we're going to set our network back at the network icon, go to network settings, and click the cog wheel, IP version 4, and we'll set this back to automatic. Hit apply. I'll cycle it on and off. My default route is still wrong. For some reason, CentOS could be because uh, we haven't patched our CentOS. has a bug in it. So I'm going to close that window down, hit Activities, and then I'll click little X to close it. At the command line, we can type in route, as it says in step 20. I see that we have a 172 number still stuck. But I am getting the 147 number, or you should get a 192 number probably at your house. So to fix that, we will edit the Etsy sysconfig network scripts, the ifconfig enp 0 s 3 file. We go in and find the static addresses assigned. And we'll delete those. I can hit D twice on the keyboard to delete a line. So if I tap DD, 
Notice the line goes away. Now it's on prefix. I'll type DD and it goes away. And then we have the gateway. Again, DD. And then there's the DNS server stuck in there. I'll hit DD again. So those are all of the addresses that we had typed in that were still stuck in this file. If you make a mistake, you can type in colon Q exclamation point to quit and then go back and try to re-edit and delete lines. Once it is correct, you do a colon WQ. So if you happen to hit DD too many times, deleted an extra line, you'd quit without saving, then go back in. So I'm going to write and quit. And then I'll do my system control restart network. And then I'll type in route again. And I'll notice I don't have any of the 172 numbers anymore. So this sets us up to go on to the next uh, lab that deals with time protocol. So they want us to go to Ubuntu and we need to get our network adapter back to uh, working order. So we set this back to bridged. You'll do an if down ETH0 to bring your ethernet down. You'll do an if up ETH0 to bring it back up and it should get a 192 or in my case a 147 number and fix the IP address. I'm going to clear the screen after I got the network adapter back out of the uh, DHCP address from, from CentOS. We'll do an app get install NTP network time protocol. So we'll install this uh, package. Currently with VirtualBox running and our VirtualBox editions installed, Ubuntu is actually getting its time from our Windows machine, which is then getting its information from the internet. But to go over this protocol, it's really important. The servers need to have their time exact, also clients. There's a lot of security protocols that if their computers are more than five minutes off from each other, they will not function. Windows updates will not function if you're off by too much. So here we're going to do a ps-ef type grep ntpd to see if it is running. It is. So after we installed it started up running. So let's do a service stop. Sorry, service ntp stop. So stop the service. We'll do an ntp date dash u, then we'll put zero dot ubuntu dot pool dot ntp dot org and hit enter. This will go out and find a group of time servers on the internet that's closest to us and it'll add it to a list and update our time. It says do this several times until the offset is relatively low. Well we're running Windows, which has correct time, and then Ubuntu is getting it through Windows. So my offset's already 0 0.02 seconds off. So that's extremely low already. So I only needed to do that once. Service start, no, service NTP start. Brings it up running. NTP Q dash P prints the servers. Yours may be different depending on your physical location, on which ones you get. So that's just showing that uh, we've got one, two, three, four, five servers that we can communicate with and update time. So I'm going to go and exit out of Ubuntu. And it wants us to do the same thing on Scent OS. Before we do that on Scent, I'm going to show you one website. It's called pool.ntp. Org. On this site, you have active NTP servers. Of course, we're in North America, so we'd click North America. And it's got a listing of servers that you can set. There's four of them, and each one of them 
has a large number of computers connected to them. So it's a pool of computers. Looks like a total of 672 servers active for IP version 4. And your computer communicates with the closest one to get an accurate time. So there's lots of systems out there. VMware, Linux, Windows stuff that I normally use these addresses for and make sure that time is updated. So in CentOS, they switched over from NTP. It's still using the network time protocol, but it's another program, Crony. So we'll type in less etsy crony.config. I said look at the configuration file. And if you want to make yourself a, an actual time server, you can go uncomment some of these and set yourself as a local stratum server and to allow local clients to communicate. I do a little bit more reading on Google to see how to set up as a local time source, but that's only if you have a physical atomic clock attached to your system, typically through a serial port. And most places aren't going to do that. You're going to be getting yours from a atomic clock over the internet. So, crony sources dash v I'm typing it wrong. I'm leaving off the C at the end. There we go. And this shows the addresses that CentOS has attached to for keeping updates. If you notice, this was automatically installed and on. We didn't have to configure it for uh, Red Hat or the CentOS system. So a lot of systems already pre-configure to get time because it's very, very important for security protocols to work. And for log files, if somebody hacks into your system, you'd like to know exactly when that happened or if your system is unstable, exactly when is it unstable. So that finishes... Uh, these two videos, or these two sections I should say, and it also finishes the video.